Welcome to our Bible study here at Influence Church. My name is Inzaman Mirza and I'm the lead pastor at Influence Church. We've been doing a series from the book of 2 Corinthians and today we want to continue on that series. This weekend is a very special weekend in the Christian calendar. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday 2021 and we want to talk a little bit more about receiving the Holy Spirit. So before we get into this study, if you didn't do so as yet, why not click the share button right below? And of course, if you're viewing this on YouTube, why not click either the subscribe button that's either on this side or it's on this side. I'm not too sure, but subscribe. If you've missed any of our Bible studies, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can click the videos tab and then you can rewatch any of our previous Bible studies. We even did a Bible study on speaking in tongues just a couple of weeks ago. So if you didn't see that as yet, why not go and click and follow up on that study that we did. Once you've done all those things, let's get ready. Let's grab your Bible. I like to tell people grab a notepad so you can take some notes. Grab those, both those things and let's get into our study for tonight. So we're going to, we're going to be studying the topic of how to receive the Holy Spirit. And this is a really, really big topic. There's going to be a lot of information to cover, but don't worry, we are going to get through this. I want you to know in advance that it's going to be a detailed study. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but it's also going to require your concentration and it's going to require you as well to put aside the distractions and to really examine the scriptures that we're going to look at. We're going to dispel some myths and some misconceptions in this study. And we're going to really give you the truth of what the Bible says on how you could receive the Holy Spirit. So this Sunday is Pentecost. And we know that the very first Pentecost, the day of celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit, was just over 2,000 years ago and in the upper room where the disciples of Jesus, after he had left and ascended into heaven, they waited in the upper room for the promise, promise of the Holy Spirit. So how do you receive the Holy Spirit? What is needed? What do you need to do? And we have been studying from 2 Corinthians, so I'm going to start there with my text for this study, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. So turn your Bible very quickly, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. And it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17, Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Verse 18, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Now I know what you're thinking, right? These verses that I just read is about relationships, right? Be not unequally yoked. Usually when we hear that verse, it's speaking about marriage, it's speaking about dating, it's speaking about relationships. So how is it now that we are using these verses to speak about receiving the Holy Spirit? Well, while they do have an application to relationships, what stands out to me is verse 16, where Paul, remember like we said in our previous study, the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians was written by Paul to the church in Corinth. Paul pulls out a passage from the Old Testament. He references a promise of God. What is this promise? The promise is that I will dwell in them and walk among them. This is speaking about receiving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit living on the inside, dwelling inside of them, inside of you and I. So this is where this verse really speaks about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And it gives us some context on what makes our vessels uh, fit for the Holy Spirit to dwell in it. Now, before we move forward and we speak about how we receive the Holy Spirit, I want to go through some biblical examples of how people in the book of Acts, the new believers after the day of Pentecost, how they received the Holy Spirit. And as we do that, I want to deal with some myths and some misconceptions. And I want to really tackle how do you not receive the Holy Spirit? Because in church culture, we may have learned certain things that we need to do to receive the Holy Spirit, certain things that we need to say to receive the Holy Spirit. And not all of it, most of it actually, is not biblical. 
And I want us to really see what the Bible has to say concerning these things. So we're going to talk about myths about receiving the Holy Spirit. And the first thing I want to speak about is the topic of waiting. So we'd oftentimes hear that if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, you need to wait. Why is it? Because the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, this is what Jesus said to them. He said, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So he said to them, what? You need to wait for the Holy Spirit. Yes, these disciples, they had to wait. Now, Jesus was ascending into heaven and they had to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit because Jesus was going to give them the Holy Spirit. Before this, they did not have the Holy Spirit. So yes, they had to wait. But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. The promise of the Holy Spirit as given by Jesus was fulfilled. And from that day, that promise has already been given. They no longer have to wait and you no longer have to wait on the Holy Spirit. So that's the first thing when it comes to wait, all right? This verse here is an example of waiting. And I'm not saying that, no, I'm not saying that, no, you don't have to wait at all. I'm just saying that waiting is not a requirement biblically for receiving the Holy Spirit. While it is what happened for this people group, it is not a doctrine whereby we can base how to receive the Holy Spirit is you need to wait. All right. So I'm not saying that waiting is bad. I'm not saying that you won't have periods where you have to wait on on the blessings of God when you have to wait to receive the gift of the of, of different gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I'm saying that waiting is not a step that is involved in receiving the Holy Spirit. These group of people, the disciples, the first um, apostles, they got the instructions from Jesus to wait in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit did not pour out as yet among believers, right? They did wait 10 days. And later, after the 10 day, the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost. And that's why we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But you and I, we don't have to wait. I want to establish that. So that's the first misconception, right? Um, One of these, I know sometimes people try to lay out steps and how do you receive the Holy Spirit? Waiting is not a step. Waiting is not a requirement to receive the Holy Spirit. Secondly, water baptism. And uh, I, I include a little picture here and that's from our water baptism last year 2020 right and some people would say that for you to receive the holy spirit the baptism of the holy spirit you must first be baptized in water you must first be baptized in water and the reason for that justification comes from acts chapter 19 verses 4 to 6 it says then paul said john indeed baptized of repentance saying to the people they should believe in him who would come after him that is on jesus christ so to set some context Paul had went to this group of people and they were disciples, they were followers, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. And when asked, have you received the Holy Spirit? They've said, they said, we haven't even heard of such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And then Paul responds to them that John, he did baptize in repentance, but Jesus Christ is the one that baptized in the Holy Spirit. And verse 5 says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, usually people would use this verse to say, well, you have to be water baptized first before you could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason why this group of people needed to be water baptized is because they were never baptized in the name of Jesus. They were baptized in the name of John. John was the cousin of Jesus. He was the forerunner to Jesus and he prepared the way for Jesus and he did baptize people saying repent for the kingdom of God is at hand but he did not baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ because he didn't even know Jesus as yet because he was born before Jesus and he started his ministry before Jesus when he did meet Jesus he said to his followers this is the one that I speak of my sandals I'm not his sandals I'm not even fit to untie follow him and he sent his believers his followers his disciples to follow Jesus instead However, this group of people who were baptized under John, they did not know of Jesus. So therefore, if they didn't know Jesus, then they could not have received the forgiveness that Jesus that Jesus gave to them on the cross when he shed his blood. And if they can't receive that forgiveness and they can't receive Jesus, then they can't receive the Holy Spirit. All right. So water baptism, and I'm going to give you more evidence for why water baptism is not a requirement for receiving the Holy Spirit. Right. Let's continue. Water baptism number three. 
laying on of hands. And this comes from the same passage that we just read because after Paul um, baptized them, he laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. It says, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Does that mean now that somebody, a man of God, like an apostle, like Paul was an apostle or a pastor, have to come now and lay hands on you for you to receive the Holy Spirit? The answer for that is no, because this is a one-off example. On the day of Pentecost, when the disciples in the upper room received the Holy Spirit, no one laid hands on them. You won't see that there. Here, however, Paul lays hands. Does it mean that, yes, you can receive the Holy Spirit through the laying on a hand? Yes, it is a possibility, but it's not a requirement. It's not a definite. This is the only way. Someone has to lay hands on you for you to be able to receive the Holy Spirit. And I want you to establish that. So that's a myth, right? It does. You do not have to have someone lay hands on you for you to receive the Holy Spirit. While, yes, it is possible you can receive the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands, it is not a requirement, right? So we have laying on of hands. Let's move along now um, to Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 46, right? This example here dispels the argument that you have to be water baptized first to receive the Holy Spirit. It dispels the argument that you have to have someone lay on hands on you for you to receive the Holy Spirit, right? And this passage is where Peter first took the gospel to the Gentiles after Cornelius appeared to him, Cornelius servants appeared to him and God showed him to go to Cornelius' house. He went there and this is the first time the message of Jesus goes to the Gentiles. Who was the Gentiles? The Gentiles were you and I, those who were not born a Jew and who weren't the, the Israelites, right? Gentiles is anyone who was not born a Jew. And it says in verse 44, when Peter was still speaking these words because he went to them and he started sharing with them about Jesus Christ, what Jesus came to do, how he accomplished it. He, he started sharing the gospel that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for them, that they are forgiven, that they are, they are cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ, that their eternity is in heaven and all they have to do is believe, confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then it says in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, now notice this, he didn't lay on his hands, he didn't water baptize them, he just met them and he was now sharing, he was basically preaching his sermon to some, a group of people for the very first time. And while he was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, right? Just simply hearing the word of God brought the Holy Spirit baptism over them. It wasn't laying on of hands. It wasn't baptism, all right? And it wasn't them waiting. They didn't even wait. They just, they, they didn't even finish hearing the sermon, right? The sermon was still going on. They, P Peter didn't even have time to make the altar call, you know, and say the salvation prayer. And they already received the Holy Spirit. And it says, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. So basically those are the Jews, right? The circumcision. As many as came with Peter. So those are the men who came along with Peter. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now this verse, verse 46, opens up a big can of worms, right? Because let's, let's, let's read it here. It says that, they were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit had poured out on the Gentiles also. Now, why did they think that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles? They thought so because of what verse 46 say. For they heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. Which brings in the big question of, is the evidence or is it that, is, is it that only speaking in tongues is a proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Receiving the Holy Spirit. So we said that you don't need to wait. That's not a biblical requirement. You don't need to lay on your hands. You don't need to be water baptized. Question is now, is it that proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you speak in tongues? Because here we see that they spoke in tongues. If we rewind to the previous examples that we covered, when Paul went to the group and, and they got baptized, they spoke in tongues. When the disciples in the upper room received the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. So all the examples we covered so far, the evidence of the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been speaking in tongues. Does that mean now that proof of, water of um, Holy Spirit baptism is speaking in tongues? So if you have never spoken in tongues, does that mean now that you don't, you've never received the Holy Spirit or you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit? This is the big question here, right? Because we see here that the evidence that they looked for 
was that they heard them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. Let's not forget that they were magnifying God, they were praising God. But it's really the speaking in tongues. Now, it does not say if they're speaking in tongues is a foreign language or if they're speaking in tongues is a heavenly language, right? Most Bible scholars may assume and most people would assume he's speaking about, they're speaking about a heavenly language, right? But there is the possibility that it's not a heavenly language. It could be an earthly language. So that brings us to this question now. Is it true that for you to have the Holy Spirit, you must speak in tongues? Or the only evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues? And my answer to that is no, right? You can receive the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. Now, I believe that at the point of salvation, at the point of really giving your heart to Jesus, you are now filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit now lives inside of you, right? Now, all these examples that we just saw, when that occurred, when the Holy Spirit came into the believers, they spoke in tongues. But I am going to show you an example of someone who did receive Jesus and was filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and did not speak in tongues at that moment of receiving the Holy Spirit. And that person that I'm going to give an exa as an example is none other than, would you believe it, the man who's, who wrote First and Second Corinthians, the man who we just spoke about going to the group of people who were baptized on the John and baptizing them on the Jesus and laying over their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The person that we're going to use as an example here is Paul the Apostle. Now, Paul the Apostle, as we know previously, known as Saul, was a persecutor of the Jews. On the road to Damascus, something happened where Jesus revealed himself to Paul and Paul was then left blind. Paul then went to the house of Ananias and Ananias was told by God to go to Paul and to minister to Paul. Ananias was very afraid to do this because he knew Paul was a murderer, but he chose to follow the word of God. In verse 17 it says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him said, now we see here again, laying on of hands, but we establish that laying on of hands is not a requirement. While yes, it is a good practice, it is not a requirement. It's not the only way to receive the Holy Spirit. So he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Immediately, he received his sight, he arose and was baptized. They're not, now, they are speaking both of water baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because Ananias said, Brother Saul, I came to you that you may receive sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Saul received the Holy Spirit at that moment, previously known Saul, now to be known as Paul. And he was baptized in the Holy Spirit in that very moment. But we don't see recorded in scripture that he spoke in tongues. All right. The evidence that he was baptized was there was a life change. He no longer wanted to murder Christians, but now he wanted to make sure he shared the truth of Jesus Christ. Does that mean now that Paul never spoke in tongues? And the answer again to that is no. Paul did speak in tongues. How do we know that? We know that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18 to 19, I thank God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet, I would rather speak five words in my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in tongues. So Paul did speak in tongues. However, there is no biblical evidence to tell us when Paul began to speak in tongues. What we do know is speaking in tongues, just as interpretation of tongues, just as um, prophecy, just as word of knowledge, just as word of faith, just as miracles and healings, these are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. And a gift of the Holy Spirit can be received at the moment of being filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit, or it can be received at a later date. As a matter of fact, I'm a firm believer that as you grow, more gifts are entrusted into your hands as a believer. I believe that as you grow, as you grow, more gifts of the Holy Spirit are entrusted into your hands as a believer. What does the Bible say? He who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. 
Now, some people, when they get baptized and they receive the Holy Spirit, immediately they begin speaking in tongues. They receive that gift of speaking in tongues immediately. Others might receive it later on, like Paul. We don't know when he received the gift of speaking in tongues, but he did speak in tongues, and he, he, that is biblically recorded. For myself, when I, got, when I accepted Jesus and I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I continued serving in ministry, and the gifts of the Spirit was evidence in my life, but not the gift of speaking in tongues, different gifts. Until much later on, when I was at the age of 23 and about to start pastoral ministry, and I was seeking God for the gift of speaking in tongues, then I received the gift of speaking in tongues. Does that mean that all the time I was doing ministry from the age of 12 till the age of 23, I had no Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me. I was not being led of the Holy Spirit. When I heard the voice of God, it wasn't God speaking to me. It wasn't the Holy Spirit living inside of me, guiding me, teaching me, comforting me, revealing all truths to me. No. That's not the case. It was the Holy Spirit the entire time. But the gifts change. Even after starting pastoral ministry, I received different gifts of the Holy Spirit that I did not have before. Because as you grow, the gifts of God grows in your life. Because God is seeing you are doing more for God, so He has to entrust more giftings into you. Remember, the gifts of the Holy Spirit is for the preaching of the Word of God and it's for the edifying of the body. It's for the building of the kingdom of God. It's not for self-glorification. It's not for profit. It's not for any kind of gain. So therefore, if you aren't ministering to people, if you aren't doing the work of God, then God isn't going to enable you with giftings of the Holy Spirit. Simply put, right? But as you do more for God, God is going to continue to equip you with gifts from His Holy Spirit so that you will be well able to do the task that He has called you and entrusted into your hands for you to do. So, speaking in tongues is not, and let me make that clear, speaking in tongues is not, is not an indicator, and it's not the only indicator that you have been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. What the Bible says is really the indicator. It tells us in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is really the indicator. That is the litmus test. That's what tells us if someone really has the Spirit of Jesus living inside them. If you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, meekness, self-control, right? If you have these nine fruit of the Holy Spirit, then we know that you are walking in the Spirit and the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Not necessarily the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there was a video that would have been circulating on um, social media last Sunday, right, concerning a group of people that went out in public and they were, um, they were what, what some would call manifesting gifts of the Holy Spirit. But from that, from, the, from examining the fruit and what they then said afterwards about people uh, wishing death upon certain, a certain group of people, it's clear to see that the fruit of the Spirit is not in them. So while they may be able to falsify a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, by using whatever antics or even some foreign spirit, they don't really have the Holy Spirit living inside of them because the fruit is not there, right? Um, without the, every um, a, a apple tree will bear apple, right? The, whatever the tree is, the fruit would be produced of that tree. But if the Holy Spirit, which is in this analogy, the tree isn't living inside of you, then the fruits of the Holy Spirit wouldn't be produced out of you, all right? So, Speaking in tongues, yes, is a manifestation gift, but it's not a defining thing that lets you know that this person has been filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I know in church context, sometimes we have services that are meant to be anointing night services or have services where it's meant to be Pentecost Sunday service where you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, in those services, due to misconceptions, we line people up and we even make people believe that they have not received the Holy Spirit unless they begin speaking in tongues. And they have to wait maybe all night. They have to tarry in the presence of God and keep pushing on and you know, until they start to speak in tongues. And only when they start to speak in tongues, then they've been baptized. No, that is not true. They have received the Holy Spirit, but the manifestation of the gift of speaking in tongues have not been received as yet. It may be received at that point. Maybe they may never receive the gift of speaking in tongues. Paul said, do all speak in tongues? Do all prophesy? No, not everyone does. It is a gift, however, of the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's continue on because I have some notable mentions of some other myths that people tend to believe are necessary for speaking in tongues. And these three, I didn't even need to bring scripture verses to, re, to rebut them because they are so ridiculous. Um, to be honest, there is no biblical background, not even um, 
not even scriptures that could be extrapolated and, and twisted to kind of support these things. But yet, it is something that happens in Christian culture. It is something that people tend to believe at times. So notable mentions. To receive the Holy Spirit, you need to lose control. That is not true, right? The Holy Spirit does not, will not, and will never seek to control you. All right? God never seeks to control anyone. That's why the gift that God gave to humanity was free will, right? God was never in the business of control because control removes love. And God loves us. God is love. So the idea that the Holy Spirit, we have to let God control us through the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit do what he has to do. Let loose and let the Holy Spirit um, make you swing around and fly across you. That, that is not biblical, right? The only spirit that seeks to control a human is a demonic spirit, okay? The only spirit that seeks to control humans are demonic spirits, not the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to lose control. And some people would use the scripture verse of, of um, don't quench the Holy Spirit to mean that if you um, don't lose control and let the Holy Spirit do whatever he has to do through you, then you are quenching the Holy Spirit. That is biblically inaccurate. The context of quenching the Holy Spirit speaks about extinguishing or stopping the work of God through you. That is not speaking about a manifestation. This is speaking about if God has given you, has, has called you to, um, to give, right? <laughs> I probably shouldn't have used that example. But say, what, whatever it may be, right? Let's say God has called you to teach kids and you've chosen to not do that. You've chosen to um, focus on your career instead of, and you are avoiding that gift and you're not following that call of God, then you, that is a way that you are quenching your Holy Spirit. Quenching your Holy Spirit is not, if your hand shaking up, let it shake up, right? This, no, I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not seeking to criticize any group of Christianity or, or any way that we as human beings respond to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because yes, when you do receive the Holy Spirit, when there's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, when there's a move of the Holy Spirit, as a human being, your emotions, your spirit responds to that. And at times it might lead you to maybe um, what, what we term as, um, as be slain in the Holy Spirit, where you might lose consciousness for a second or so, or maybe you might begin to speak in tongues, or maybe you might feel a shiver in your body. This is your body responding to the move of the Holy Spirit, right? And you have control over your body in that moment. Some people make you believe that you don't have control. You have to do whatever you feel. That's not true. This is you responding in your body to something that is supernatural. And you could control how you respond to it. And <laughs> controlling how you respond to it is not quenching the Holy Spirit. All right? This is not quenching the Holy Spirit. Number two is beg. You don't have to beg for a gift, right? You, have you ever had to beg for a gift? If it's a gift, it's given to you, it's yours, you don't beg for it, right? The Holy Spirit is a gift, and the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit are gifts. Therefore, you don't beg, you don't beg, you don't beg God. You don't beg God, beg God, beg God, God, I want this gift, God, I want this gift. No, you ask in prayer, and the Bible tells us he's a, God is a, a good father, he's a, much better than an earthly father who would maybe give you a soup, and when you ask for bread, God will give you much more. Right? So God will give you the gifts. Um, sometimes, yes, you do have to wait. Now, we did say that waiting is not a requirement to be filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yes, current time you accept Jesus, you believe Holy Spirit fills you. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to manifestation gifts, like I said, that comes as you grow and as you give more to God in terms of your service and as well in, in terms of your heart, your body, your soul. Number three, you don't have to mimic someone else. Now, this for me is the most disheartening thing because I know people group that teach people how to speak in tongues. They teach people how to pronounce different syllables and how to roll your tongue a little bit to be able to speak in tongues. And that is completely unbiblical. I dare you to find any passage of scripture where that happens in the Bible. That is not biblical, right? That is not biblical. So you don't have to listen to someone else and try to mumble along to what they are saying and try to mimic it. No, that is a false representation. That is not actually speaking in tongues. That is not actually the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? So not because you see somebody else shaking up, it means that you need to start shaking up to receive the Holy Spirit, right? That is not the case. Don't mimic. Don't try to mimic uh, thinking that that would make you 
um, now receive the Holy Spirit. That's not true. So that's just some notable mentions. Um, if you think there's somehow biblical evidence for this, please leave it in the comment, message me. I would love to discuss that with you. Right? So that's some notable mentions. What did Jesus say? I know we, like I told you guys, this is going to be a Bible study where there's a lot of information, right? Yeah, we covered a lot, got a lot in, right? Loosen your, um, your spiritual belt a little bit. You're going to be digesting and taking in a little more content, right? What did Jesus say when it, came, came, when it comes to receiving the Holy Spirit? What did he say? Because obviously Jesus is our guide to all truth. Um, what did he say to the believers and how, they should, how would they receive the Holy Spirit? Remember, that's the topic that we were discussing, how to receive the Holy Spirit. And the first passage I want to look at is John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17. This is where Jesus gives the promise of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father. Now that, that's, 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 that's so important, right? Who is praying for us to receive the Holy Spirit? Jesus is. That, that's, I find that to be really cool. I find that to be um, really powerful. I find that to, to make me feel as though I am really important in the sight of God. That Jesus would be praying for me to receive the Holy Spirit. Like, so God wants me to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants me to receive the Holy Spirit. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. He's praying for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, <laughs> Uh, but, and then it continues, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, the helper, which is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Now, this is important because now we're really starting to get into what are the requirements to receive the Holy Spirit. So the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's pay attention to that. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him. Right? The world does not know, nor does he see, nor, nor do they see the Holy Spirit. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you. Right? So Jesus says to his disciples, now put it in context, he's not speaking to you and I, he's speaking to his disciples. He's saying to the disciples, you already know the Holy Spirit. Right? And I'm like, how do they know, Jesus? How, how would they know? How, how, how do they know? <laughs> Like, how, how, how did they know Jesus? And the, the key here to knowing how they knew the Holy Spirit is right here in this verse. He says, for he dwells with you. He dwells with you. And the disciples of Jesus, while he was on earth, already knew the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was dwelling with them. And then he says, and he will be in you. Now, the Holy Spirit was not in them as yet. But he was with them already. The Holy Spirit was not in them as yet, but the Holy Spirit was with them already. The Holy Spirit was already with the disciples. How do I know that? How do they know? <laughs> Nobody's going to know how they're going to know. How do I know that? The Holy Spirit dwells with the disciples. And we see this in Luke chapter 9, verse 1 to 2. It says, Then he called his twelve disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons. Where did they get this power and authority from? From the Holy Spirit that was dwelling with them. Because it was through the power of the Holy Spirit that they were able to cast out demons and cure disease. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was already with them. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Right? So the Holy Spirit was with them. With them. Not in them. With them. Then in Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. This is when Jesus sent out the seventy into, to, to, to preach the gospel. Right? All of this is while he is alive. This is before he died, before the resurrection. The Holy Spirit was already with them. As a matter of fact, let's backtrack. The Holy Spirit was not only with the disciples, but the Holy Spirit was with all the great men of the Old Testament, all the prophets, all the kings, right? The Holy Spirit was already with them. All the priests, all the scribes, all the, um, from the tribe of, the, of Levite. And the Holy Spirit was already with them. Can we show you? promised to dwell in them. He was already with them, right? The passage that we were just, well, that we started off with, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18, it quotes in verse 16 that what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
since the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was already with them, all right? The Holy Spirit was the one that anointed um, David to be the next king of Israel when Samuel came to him. The Holy Spirit was the one that was speaking to Samuel. The Holy Spirit was always upon the great men of God in the Old Testament. But he could not live inside of them. Why? Because for your temple to be fit for the Holy Spirit to live inside, it needed the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus to purify your temple so that it can be a place where God could dwell. Because God can only dwell in a place that is holy, a place that is sanctified. God cannot dwell where there is sin, right? So he says to them, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them. And this was a promise given since the Old Testament. We see in Exodus 29 and verse 45, the same verse, Leviticus 26 and verse 12, Jeremiah 31 and verse 33, Jeremiah 32 and verse 38, Ezekiel 37 verse 26 to 27, Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 8. All these verses are the same promise of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in them. The Holy Spirit always dwelled with man. Remember, when, even in creation, the Holy Spirit uh, moved over the face of the earth. And we know that creation was with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit was always up, upon the face of the earth, and He was always with man. But only on the day of Pentecost did the Holy Spirit shift from being with man to being inside of us. Inside of us. All right? This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all, look at this, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here we see the shift from the Holy Spirit being with man to the Holy Spirit being in man. This is what Jesus promised in the book of John, that the Holy Spirit will be in you, right? This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came into disciples. So why did disciples have to wait? Because the Holy Spirit had not been in them before, but the Holy Spirit was with them. For you to have the Holy Spirit in you, right? What did Jesus say? Jesus said the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because they do not know Him. And to know the Holy Spirit, you need to know Jesus. That's as simple as I get. To know the Holy Spirit, you need to know Jesus. And as you accept Jesus and you get into a relationship with Jesus, that is when the Holy Spirit comes and fills your vessel. So how to receive the Holy Spirit? Let's really answer the question now after we've done all those all this study, after we've um, seen all this information, after we've read all these passages, we still have not answered the question, how do you really receive the Holy Spirit? And to receive the Holy Spirit, we're going back to the verse that we started with in um, Corinthians. It says, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And I've highlighted and read this phrase, they shall be my people. Because out of all the steps and all the formulas and all the things that men would tell you the simple truth to how to receive the holy spirit is to be a child of god and they shall be my people you have to be you have to be you have to be a child of god that's as simple as it is you have to receive Jesus Christ and be in a relationship with God. When you accept Jesus Christ and you enter into a relationship with God and you belong to God, you, you honor God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and then you are God. You belong to God. And it's really about ownership. It's about ownership. It's about who you belong to. That is what it's really about. It's all about ownership. And the reason I, I use this passage from 2 Corinthians, right? which speaks about do not be unequally yoked, is because unequally yoked speaks about a connection, right? When, they, when the Bible speaks about unequally yoked, they're speaking about where two animals, two large animals, usually two cattle, they are connected by a yoke. There's something that ties around their neck. Usually it's made of wood and it's a strong frame that connects one animal to the other and it's, it's connected through a wooden frame that yokes them together. And for, the, for these two large animals to go anywhere, to do anything, they must do it together. Or the one that is slightly stronger would then pull the other one to the direction that they want. For them to eat and bend their head, 
they have to do it together because they are connected by the neck. For them to go in any direction, left or right, they have to do it together. This is why we are speaking about being yoked together. What does it say? For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Lessness. And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And he said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So what are you yoked to? If you have not received the Holy Spirit, what are you yoked to? Because whatever you are yoked to is what is keeping you back from receiving the Holy Spirit. If you are yoked to God, you will have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So it's what you are yoked to. And while this passage speaks about being unequally yoked and it speaks about being separate, don't, um, don't misunderstand this passage to be speaking about segregism. 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 Se segregism. Anyhow, you know what I mean, right? It's speaking about being separate, but it's not speaking about um, classism. It's not speaking about being saying that you are better than anybody else, about saying that you are the only you are from this people group and in terms of the church and you can't in, interact with anybody else. This verse here where it speaks about unequally yoked, it speaks about light and darkness, having communion. It is speaking about having intimate relationship and being yoked together and connected together with that that is not of God. Because if it was speaking about, well, you should never talk, have friends with somebody who is not a believer. You should not have um, any acquaintances with people who is not believers. You should have no co-workers who is not believers. If it was speaking about that, then it would be contradictory to what Jesus did. Right? Because when Jesus came, he went to the sinners. He saved the sinners. He saved the woman who was in adultery. He saved the, the Samaritan woman who had five husbands. Right? He saved the sinners. Right? He saved the teeth that was on the cross that said, um, I believe. And in that moment, Jesus said, today you would be with me in paradise. So Jesus did go and carry the gospel to the sinners, but he was never yoked to them. He was never connected to them. He was never tied to them in a spiritual or physical way. How do we tie to someone in a physical way? Well, in marriage, we tie to them in a physical and spiritual way. Um, so, so there are different ways. There are other ways in terms of partnerships, like even maybe business partnerships could be you, a case of yoking with someone that is not like-minded. And by business partnership, I don't mean like you have a business and somebody else has a business and you work together with them. I mean in that you are you and that person are running the same business together, right? That could be a yoke in where you're now connected with somebody that is not of the same mindset as you, that is not a follower of Jesus Christ. So in, some, in summary, to receive the Holy Spirit, it's all about ownership. God has to have ownership over you. You need to belong to God. You need to surrender your life to God, surrender your heart to God. You need to give it all to God. And I want to close with this verse in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, and mammon here being the God of money. Now, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that for you to have the Spirit of God living inside of you, your life has to belong entirely to God. You can't be serving more than one thing. You can't be yoked to something that is unrighteous something that is of darkness because your body now is a temple of God and maybe the reason why you're finding it so difficult to be to have that filling of the Holy Spirit and see the fruit of it through the fruits of the Holy Spirit the fruit of the Holy Spirit is because you maybe are not giving all to God or there is some yoking or some connection to something that is not of God and what Jesus says you cannot serve two masters you cannot and I know sometimes when we hear that verse of serving to masters, you think that it speaks about having a, a, um, being of a different religion and, and, being, and, and still saying I'm a Christian. And yes, that is true, right? But it's speaking about all the different ways that we put our heart into something else that is not of God. Because anything that you serve with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might is an idol or becomes an idol. Because the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might without your strength without your mind so if you fulfill the first and greatest commandment then you now belong to god god has ownership of you because you've given all to god but if you are not fulfilling the first and greatest commandment then the holy spirit 
cannot live inside of you. And the second commandment, which is like the first commandment, is proof that you are fulfilling the first commandment because the second commandment is love your neighbors as yourself. And if you really love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then you'll be able to love your neighbors as yourself. So you see, it's a whole conundrum here. It's all tied together, right? So in simplicity, to receive the Holy Spirit, you need to give your all to God. You need to give your life to God. And you need to ensure that your vessel is being cleansed by the blood of Jesus and you're not holding on to things that are not of God. And as you do that, the Holy Spirit will take up residence inside of you. It's as simple as saying, God, I believe Jesus died for me. I receive his forgiveness. Cleanse me in your blood. I repent of my sins. I accept Jesus in, into my life. And I commit to serving Jesus from this day forward. And as you do those things that are required to show the fruit of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, such as you turn away from your ways, you really repent, you turn away. Repentance is not remorse, but it's a turning away. As you do that, the Holy Spirit will come and dwell inside of you. We've seen so much biblical examples where it doesn't require anything in specific for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? It's just a simple ownership. The promise of the Holy Spirit is that Jesus, had, um, Paul said it, it was promised in the Old Testament. Jesus said it as well. <laughs> he said, obey my, let me just show you back, right? He says, obey my commandments. If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So it's not about works, of course not, it's not about works, but it is about setting your heart in the right place where you are not yoked to anything else, you are not connected to anything else but God. I'm not saying that God is the only thing that you think about, talk about. I'm saying that when it comes to that yoking, that connection, that tie, your relationship is with God is the only tie that you have. There is nothing in the way of that. You're not serving two masses. You're not connected to God, yoked to God, and yoked to money or yoked to career or yoked to pride or yoked to hatred or yoked to unforgiveness or yoked to, um, to, to addiction. All these things are, are things that when you are yoked to all these different things, your, your vessel now is not a place where the, where the Holy Spirit can dwell in. It's not a temple that the Spirit can, of God can dwell in. So to receive the Holy Spirit, you just have to Give your all to God. Forget all the um, all the things that men would have told you that are requirements, that are steps to take. We study through the Bible. And yes, there are times when laying on of hands you receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, there are times where you do have to wait for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation. Yes, um, in some cases, yes, it's, yes, you should be water baptized. But it's not that this is the only way and it has to be done for you to receive the Holy Spirit. And like we say, um, speaking in tongues is not the um, evidence of having received the Holy Spirit. The evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit of God. The manifestation of speaking in tongues is the gift of the Spirit, just like other gifts as in prophesying, as in word of knowledge, as in healing. And those gifts come as you grow. May not come all at once, may not come at the point of salvation, at the point of receiving the Holy Spirit, but they come as you grow. So, in all simplicity, the Holy Spirit is... If you have accepted Jesus, if you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and you love God with all your heart, soul, and might, and you have received His commandments, as in you love God and follow those the main two commandments, right? that means that you already have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. If you have the evidence of the Holy Spirit in terms of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, then you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And maybe you've been thinking you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to get baptized, and you are already baptized, you are already filled with the Holy Spirit. And because you haven't spoken in tongues, you think, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has already been given. It's already been poured out on the day of Pentecost. And as you receive Jesus, you are now filled with the Holy Spirit. So maybe you are already filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you've not, then it's time to repent, turn to Jesus, and have a relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit will dwell inside of you. So I hope that you were edified by the study. If you have any questions, you can leave it in the comments or you can WhatsApp me, you can message me. You can call me as well. And I love to have different perspectives and I'm open to different suggestions. You can, uh, uh, you can even challenge me. I'm glad to be challenged. I, will, I, I, I don't pretend to know everything. I'm learning as well. Um, so feel free. Any questions that you have, I'd love to discuss them. And I do pray that you were encouraged by this Bible study. And I'll see you again next Monday at 7 p.m. as we continue our Bible study. 
God bless you. Enjoy re the rest of your night. If you're viewing this at night, the rest of your day, if you're viewing this at morning, whatever time it may be, enjoy that season. God bless you richly.